Welcome back to the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast presented by Zwift for Stage 17 of the Giro d'Italia 2022 from Ponte del di Legno to Lavarone. It's a hard mountain stage, except the first one, the Passo Tonale, 8.6k, 6.3%, would allow a break to form right out of the neutral zone. And then with medium mountain fall slap downhill, there was really... No, no GC team is going to want to pace really hard all that day for 100 kilometers before the two main climbs. The Valico del Vetriolo, 12k, 7.5%, pretty hard. And it has, it's reasonably steady, a bit steeper in the middle and then flattens off. And then after that, descent, short valley, but meaningful enough, about 5 to 7k's before the Monte Rovere climb. The Menador, 8Ks, 9.6%, beautiful climb, but 5th, 6th, and 7th K are 115 11.5, 12% 12% before a rolling ridge line to the finish. And the last 500 meters are like 3 to 5% uphill. It's it Because the, there's big mountains around it on the profile, the finish is kind of subsumed into that, but it is uphill, this finish. And we saw... Pretty much a carbon copy of yesterday's break, Benji. Yeah, certainly. It was, uh, I feel like it was an easier breakaway to get away than the last few stages, though. And we once again saw Matthew Van in the breakaway. It's becoming a, a bit of a thing here that he goes into the breakaway every day, whether that's for going for the stage or making sure he has an easier fight against the time limit. Depends on what happens in the stage, I guess. But there were some other good riders in there as well. Bauman once again for Jumbo to get away two teammates, Leimerais and Ullmann. Bauman once again used today to get extra points for KOM and is now relatively secure, I think, in that jersey, to be honest. Then Ciccone was in that breakaway. Garfi, Fortunato, also in that breakaway. Two riders from Bardiani. Honestly, this team has been pretty invisible for the entire race. A few times we've seen some of their riders, but most of all, not in the most important moment of the race. And we also had Jan Hirt, winner of yesterday, once again in the breakaway. And uh, Butrago, Arends von Hausen, and so forth. Just a a strong breakaway in general, plus a rider from UAE. That was Kovi. Kovi being in the breakaway, I do want to talk about that for a second. I don't necessarily see that as an issue initially. That can become an issue if you don't use it for Almeida when he drops eventually. And I don't mind Kovi being in the breakaway on this kind of stage because if he stays in the peloton, he'll be dropped by the time that Almeida really needs him. But anyway... In that breakaway as well, Guillaume Martin, Felix Gal Martin, again trying to gain 75 minutes to get into the top 10 by the end of this Giro, which is looking to be harder and harder, to be honest. But uh, from that point onwards, that break was going quite well, was working well together at certain points, and it really came into the halfway point of the race where we saw that breakaway doing something. A rider crash in there, Santiago Butrago of Bahrain ended up actually having his bike into pieces or something, and he ended up coming back afterwards. And then we saw the first move on the flatter part in the middle of the stage, kind of in like the portion before the next climb, before the second to last climb. And that was Vanderpool attacking on the right side of the road. Three riders trying to close that down. Guillaume Martin being the first one to go. Kovia and Gold joining them up the road. And the thing that Vanderpool, I think, is doing in that situation is he knows he's not the best climber in that breakaway. He wants to get an advantage before the climb starts so that he can lose that advantage on the climb and end up with them at the top. That's kind of how I see that. But did you see a danger in that group getting away? Yeah, definitely, because maybe Martin works for GC. I mean, he is so far out of the GC picture now. It's like, give up. But I don't think he knows that. Um, so... Yeah, maybe they get away. I don't know. Envidiv, he also looking really strong on the climbs, looking in good shape. It seems like he's ridden himself into climbing shape as well. But speaking of Envidiv, Zwift is the perfect training playground for us and for him with training plans, structured interval sessions or group workouts at your disposal. No traffic lights and flat courses too. I mean, it's perfect for a recovery spin, which is how Envidiv has used it recently after a big training block to prepare for this Giro d'Italia. To get involved and join Zwift's massive community, head to Zwift.com for your free seven-day trial. i got to say, Benji, MVP's tactics have been perfect this Giro in all occasions. Every time he's attacking, it makes sense. He's not just like when he attacked on Castel Fidardo from a group that was preoccupied with GC who wouldn't have attacked him, who would have done another lap with him in the wheels. That was... 
I made no sense, panache, whatever. When he's attacking from a group of 20 guys who are going to refuse to work with him on that, uh, well, whatever that stage was, backstage eight, Napoli, makes sense. There's a reason for it. When he's attacking yeah. in valleys before mounts, there's a reason for it. He said at the start of the year, my career, it can be over before you know it, and I can't just throw away wins. And so he gave himself the best opportunity, I think, to try and win this stage once again. And in the GC group, really nothing. Ineos controlling, Ben Swift action once again. Were Bora going to try something? They didn't put anyone in the break. Kelderman and Kamner and Bookman all back in the group with uh, Jai Hindley today. Are they going to launch it? We have Butrago. Is he a satellite rider ahead? Pools is in the group. We didn't know. And as we get to the second to last climb, the main sort of the first main climb, we see that MVDP is really strong on the climb and he begins pacing in a group with Heert, Carthy, who else, Benji? Felix Gull still. Colby was also still there. Jan Heert, uh, Garf, you mentioned it. And uh, Guillaume Martin was still there. I think those were the most important names together with Kun Baumann, who was also still there trying to get those KOM points at the top. And we saw that group have a bit of an advantage on the group that still included the likes of Lehmreis and so forth. So Lehmreis was kind of doing the Almeida style on this climb, kind of dropping, kind of trying to come back. And he didn't seem like the strongest climber on this climb. And that could play an important role later. But towards the top, that group actually stayed relatively together. And it was indeed the KOM fight for Baumann that, for me, saw an opportunity of Baumann perhaps getting away. But Lehmreiser kind of kept the gap because he was trying to get second on that climb as well and i then well was expecting vanderpool to do something in the descent because you know that if he gets to that top with those other riders with the likes of a coffee and so forth he's going to have trouble to stay with them on the next climb and he needs to do something in the descent so i was i was expecting vanderpool to attack into the descent but oh a challenger appeared out of nowhere hey slamerize we sat behind him in the tt in Budapest, Benji and I in the Yumbo car, he had no radio in. And just with no radio, he was railing the corners on the TT bike there. He, he attacked on the descent, not MVDP. MVDP was dropped initially, and we have not good descenders chasing. Bowman's not going to chase his teammate, and it's Carthy, Martin, and who else? Jan Heert, who was a bit suspect yesterday. Butrago's just crashed on a descent. Bahrain have started pacing with Novak on the climb, so we're like, is Butrago just a satellite rider anyway? And Lame Riser's descent is actually one of the best descents I've seen in a long time. And with the Shark, Benji does have the Nibali outfit on today. It just came, probably not the best day for it to arrive. The Shark got maybe beached today or caught up in a fishing <laughs> net. And maybe we got we got a new, what's a fish from the Netherlands that looks like Hayes Lamriser? He's the new Shark. Because, yeah, go and watch his descent. It's beautiful. He was gapping MVP, MVP nearly crashed and unreal. And they get into this valley and you realize... They're both like 72 to 76 kilos. I don't know what MVP's exact weight is, but Lamra is a big guy. They're chopping turns in the valley, even though it's short. And you have group two dynamics behind. Jan Hirt, Carthy, it ruins their race. Their race done. They're pulling in the valley. We saw Carthy. I mean, I don't trust the heart rate data too much, but his heart rate's higher in the valleys than on the climbs. Um, he's doing work there. Bummer's not chasing. Petrago's not chasing. And they... All of a sudden, 30, 60, 90 seconds plus before the final climb, which they get to a shower at the base, and MVDP hits Lame Riser. I think Benji, he was trying to make Lame Riser give up. I think he knew that if they, they went to the steep section together, it was curtains for him, and his strategy was like, uh, I don't know, when you go out in a TT really fast like Yates did, trying to freak Haig out in the Vuelta last year. I think that's what he was trying to do. I think so as well on that final climb. Like you said, Lehmreis, he got hit, got a bit behind actually the narwhal of the Netherlands. Yes, I just Googled that. It's a name that we can That's propose for one. him. That's a good one. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they kept going like that with like Van der Poel riding like 10, 15 meters, even 20 meters at a certain point ahead of Lehmreis. But 
the gap started closing down again and it was a bit of a fight over four-ish kilometers and meanwhile while these two are fighting against each other we see that Santiago Butrago from the group behind is catching rider by rider and closing a tiny bit towards like 50 seconds 45 seconds but I'm like 45 seconds that's a lot Lehmreise gets to the wheel of Vanderpool and the narwhal of the Netherlands punches it he punches it and it wasn't really an attack it was like Vanderpool just not being able to follow at a certain point I felt like and the gap expanded with him gaining time. He has Lehmann Reiser on much of on the pool. And uh, from that point onwards, wait, we've seen quite a few times if Van der Poel actually drops on a climb, he properly drops on a climb. There's like no coming back for him in this Giro after dropping on a longer climb. So from that point on, I thought Lehmann Reiser is getting the stage, but Trago came closer and closer on that climb. Were you scared? Well, I, I was sitting there, right? Then the GC group starts to play into this. I was sitting there and Bahrain have taken up. Novak's pulled off. Pools is now pulling. And I'm like, ooh, it's early in the climb. Do they they kind of need one more once Pools pulls off because it'll be too early for Lander. <laughs> the group's too big. Almeida was already kind of being gapped. Do they call Santiago Petrago back? Because it's when he set off, it was at a minute 10. Yeah, minute 15 because Carthy and Hurt didn't have it. And I was like, is he just really going to do this for second and not go back and help the Lander group? I was wrong. Maybe he, maybe I was the DS and the try to flick the earpiece. We don't, we don't know. It did look like <laughs> earpiece, earpiece was in and Bahrain don't really call riders back unless they have to. Like put on Dauphiné, obviously he, he went for the stage win with Paig attacking behind on Juplat. Uh, but yeah, Butrago's closing in, gets to the steep section. Before we get to the denouement of this stage, mentioned that the Tour of Norway is happening right now, as well as many other races, as well as Alan Van Dyke's Our Record on Monday that you might not have uh, seen, but you can catch up. You can do that on GCM Plus, who support the Lantern Rouge Cycling Podcast Giro coverage. Tour of Norway, it's got Remco. Spoiler, he was mental yesterday. P break in the last 10K, still won the stage uphill worth tuning into if you're trying to catch some long form or short form highlights after the Giro if you can't watch everything live you can even use our code uh, for 25% off if you're in Australia UK USA Canada or Germany for an annual GCN plus subscription through the link down below but yeah but Trago gets to him Benji he's got his jersey unzipped he's out of this no not out of the hands off he's just zipping up his jersey on like 10% section I thought he should have hit him straight away because Lame Rise is a good descender and I probably Butrago, he's pretty fast in the sprint. And then he hit him with the Quintana slash Roglic. It's it's <laughs> a mix of the two. It's the first attack, and we're getting close to the summit. Big surge, pressure on, pressure on, pressure on, but he's not going full yet. And then he hits him with the Roglic kick. And I swear he gained he was out of sight. Lame riser. Couldn't respond. He completely cracked him. Butrago has come of age in this Giro and just solos away for an incredible stage win. Before we get to the GC action, Benji, what do you make of Butrago? Second in Konya stage, now winner of the Giro stage here, won a stage of Saudi tour. Like, what sort of rider can he develop into? Pretty damn good, eh? Last year, eighth in Burgos, I think, when he was so strong before the Vuelta, ended up being snubbed out of a uh, selection for that Vuelta. In the end, I forgot what the reason was personally, but eventually he was not there, and I was a bit sad about that, because I thought he deserved that after the Burgos he rode. And then he started this season with Saudi Tour, I think, where he won a stage. And then eventually that led to where we are now, where he's fighting in breakaways at this race and he's really damn good and also pretty versatile where he has that kick in the final he has that low key sprint that we saw in Saudi tour his ascending is I don't know a bit meh but that might be because he was a bit shaken up because of the crash so I wouldn't just use this stage uh, to portray his descending skills forever we'll see that in the future if he's a, a good descender or not but I, I enjoy seeing him the guy's like really damn young still like, he's at the age of 22, getting his first Giro stage. Like, this man is going to do some wonderful things in the future, and I hope that we see him at another Grand Tour next year. And the only thing that he, I think, can't do is time trial at a necessary level for GC, or do you see 
me lying in that. He lost 36 seconds on the initial prologue, which is the same as Pozzo Vivo. You see the possibility for this guy to have a GC future. I mean, who knows? Because the Bahrain setup so bad that it's impossible to know whether it's the rider or, or the equipment. I don't know. Uh, but he is, he confirmed Alejandro, who does the Lantern Rouge in Espanol um, Spanish videos. Obviously, it's called in Espanol. He's plugged in, obviously, to the Colombian cycling scene. And he said that. Butrago actually he has an additional year on his contract. So originally was okay. people thought he was out to twenty two, but he's at Bahrain till twenty three. I think that's been recently updated everywhere. So he's under lock and key for another year. He is Is he Martinez two point Benji? I know Martinez had the TT, but you know how Martinez started coming through huge stage results in hard mountain stages at Grand Tours or at World Tour level, he kind of backed toward the Crotim de Dauphiné after Rolich crashed out in 2020. He might not be as good as Martinez, obviously, but he's, as you said, he's 22. If I was Bahrain, I'd want to keep him. Um, but yeah, he's crazy good, and he, he's been good as a mountain domestique too. He's come fifth on the stage 12, just, yeah, incredible rider. And another, I guess, big plus for those of you or – who tuned into the Middle East races, Saudi Tour, Butrago. Like, there is value in watching those races. They're not meaningless. Like, Butrago is legit good and showed it there. Jan Hirt, I got kind of some tongue-in-cheek mocking when I was saying Green Mountain, like one of the best performances <laughs> ever. Like, he's fucking good on steep gradients. Like, if you do the numbers in the Middle East and you replicate those numbers in Europe, <laughs> If they're at a certain level, you're going to do well. So he wasn't good today. Can't wait to see Von Hills win in the Vuelta. Oh, it has to happen. Or yeah, Belgium. but that's the thing. His numbers were terrible. <laughs> he, nearly <laughs> Come on. By, he nearly got caught by Mezgetz on a 15% climb. So I don't know. That's a, But yeah, Betrago wasn't good that day. I don't, oh, Betrago? I think he got caught on a wrong end of crossman split. Anyway, I don't know why we're yeah. talking about Saudi Tour stay, GC <laughs> during the Giro. Back in the GC group, though, there was huge action. Not that the director wanted to show it. I had I said my piece on this yesterday, um, and my rage has now sort of turned to sadness that, you know, it's out of our control that it's not being shown. Bahrain were pacing. Almeida was gapped. He had no teammates. Port took over. Actually, and- I want to I wanna oh, put Kobe, a bit of credit. Sorry, you boy. Kobe was actually dropped back from the breakaway. Why has he got two he dropped- white shoes on? Uh, two different shoes, right? Or no? Well, nah, he, two white he... shoes. That's why I didn't oh, recognize him. Not great. That's why his form is not fantastic. Like it's the shoes that do it. But maybe yeah. high mountains. <laughs> <laughs> it's like rim brakes versus disc brakes, like yeah. shoes uh, versus t- switch shoes. But anyway, uh, he was helping Almeida a tiny bit there. But yeah, it was not gonna last too long. Almeida will have to do most of this alone, like uh, most of the Giro so far. But like you said, it was. Bahrain that was setting things up and Wout Pools that was the strongest companion for Landa in this race and I never saw Bilbao drop, I never saw Nibali drop, I never saw Pozzo Vivo drop, I never I never saw like most of the riders in that group drop and at a certain point it was Bahrain plus Hindley plus Carapaz and Ineos Domestique, right? Yeah, port pacing. It's disappointing not to see that. Like, these guys are not 12th in GC. Like, Nibali's like 5th in GC. Then show him dropping. Um, or where Almeida was. There was no time gap. And yeah, port. This was the difference, right? On Blockhouse, on uh, the medium mountain stage Bora Ascent, on some uh, whenever else they tried, Africa. Without a domestique in the final, Almeida has been able to come back or at least limit those losses a lot. And he today was different. He got dropped, Port shreds it. Holes comes back from the dead after Lander has attacked, a big attack. Paul starts pulling. Lander, to his credit, I mean, people say he doesn't... Like, he tried multiple times, at least three times today. Carapaz just defending, just defending. Hindley looked like he was doing it easy, and then he just started pacing the group. For, we saw in Africa yesterday, Nachakis did it on Twitter, and check out the Was Per Kilo article by uh, Ozzels on lanternrouge.com.au. But it shows that Carapaz is defending. He went on the front of the group to pace when it was just the three. Hindley landed out, uh, Carapaz like 5% of the time, maybe less, and he's soft pacing. It's Hindley and Lander who are stronger. And, yeah, that's basically what happened. Lander 
Kept pacing. The threes, their level is so similar. And Pauls comes back from nowhere, starts pulling the group. I think Lander, if he had... If he hadn't had pulls there over the crest of that climb, he could have been in actually big trouble. And because I think Hinley and Carapaz are way snappier than him, he needed pulls over that final crest. Yes, and I feel like at a certain point near the top, that Landa was switching from going hard at the front, keeping up his tempo, to just dropping to the back, saying to Hinley, "Okay, it's your turn now." And then sitting at the back for a bit, then starting to pace a bit more once Pools is back at the back of that group. And perhaps it was because Pools probably said to him, I'm, I'm closing back, I'm closing back. And perhaps Landa was like, okay, I need this guy. I can't pull back Butrago because the guy is going to win the stage. So I'm going to have to need someone to pace on the plateau section afterwards. With Almeida behind, I can actually have a chance of jumping onto the podium here if I keep this tempo up for that plateau. So it's better that I wait for Pools. Do you think that Landa actually made that decision to? Let pools come back? I'm not sure. It almost looked like they were doing a like a, a mini satellite ride where pools went ahead and then Lander attacked to his wheel. <laughs> I don't know. Uh, but it made a huge difference. Pools in that up and down section killed Almeida. I think Almeida was gaining on them or at least keeping it very tight and then pools just killed him. And he's on a one-year deal. I tweeted about it. He like got a contract very late at the end of last year from Bahrain. Not many teams it seemed were interested in. He's only 34. Like he's not 40. Pozzo's 39. Uh, uh, Nibli's 37. Like if he's motivated, which he seems to be, like he won Andalusia. <laughs> like I don't understand. Like Quickstep, for example, Transsign Merlius. Like you know your sponsorship is almost is extremely tied to Avonapol's performance and – like your best Mount Domestique for Avonapol right now is Jude next Diba. So, yeah, maybe you look at Walt Pauls uh, on a one year with deal with bonuses or two years. But that's the side. He was incredible, did really well. Stibar? And actually, <laughs> mate, quick step. Stibar, the best Domestique or quick step in the mountains. <laughs> okay, oh, anyway. Who? Like, what is Lefebvre doing? Who's he putting together? Von Savenon, Von Wilder, all those riders can climb better than a Stibar. And seven on, yeah, he can do 5.6 for 20. What's that going to do? Yeah, Almeida was the one, but he let him go. <laughs> he couldn't afford it. That's not his fault, really. I'm just saying, quick step, look at what poles. Probably a bit expensive now. Same with Jan Hit. Anyway, they get to this final little uphill rise, and Carapaz and Henley just nuke Lander. They actually take seven... Now they credited him with six seconds. Six seconds, no bonuses on this little uphill. Hindley in the wheel of Carapaz didn't really try to come round him. I feel like Hindley is trying to avoid the Malia Rosa. I feel like he, he he's trying to avoid it right now, and he's happy with Ineos and Carapaz having it, and he's only three seconds behind. So GC Lander takes over the third position with Quick Maths taking over a minute, a minute and... No, more than that. A minute 30. Am I reading that right? No, just just a minute on uh, minute four on Almeida. He moves into third position, which is a 50-second, 49-second lead, which is near enough the buffer he needs for that final TT. Otherwise, Bilbao got dropped hard but moves up because Pozzo, unfortunately, really cracked today. Nibali lost a lot of time to hear it in the break. And I think Bill Bow, he's only, I think, like 30 seconds ahead of him. Heat is knocking on the door too. He's a minute and 20 behind Nibali and looking much stronger in the mountains. Bookman also not looking good. Arison Valverde losing as well. So what did we learn today, Benji? Did we learn anything new? I think we just got confirmation that Almeida's week three performances that some of the Portuguese fans were hoping for might be postponed till week four because I'm not seeing it at the moment. Then if he wants to compete for the victory of this race, then he's going to have to do more than what he is currently doing, which is dropping and actually losing time on these mountain stages. So I think Almeida's highest possible thing now is podium, but he will require some kind of like dropping of one of those first three wires, which hasn't happened compared to Almeida and just better days himself in the, uh, on the bike. When it comes to Nibali, it's a fight for the top five. Like, I hope that he does something crazy in one of those last two mountain stages, but he's going to have to come from far to gain something to get on the podium. It's still like four minutes and 43 seconds now to the podium. So 
I think that's a, a lost cause there personally. But when it comes to Jan here, do you think that he would be able to be a drop, for example, Nibali, if he was with him on this climb? Because that yeah. might be required at a certain point to get into that top five. Yeah, he is climbing better than Nibali. He is climbing performance yesterday just stupid. Like, he might have done more watts than the GC guys. He had a broken bike, and it was already close. On the steep section of Santa Cristina, he went stupid fast. Like, ridiculous. And he'd been in the break. So today, for example, he's having to pull the flat before the last climb. If you're in the GC group, you don't have to be doing that shit. You don't have to be pulling the flat before the final climb. And that's what really seems to kill guys like Martin, uh, Hitt, and Carthy. GC group, I think he he's too close or should be too close to be allowed in the break anymore. If I was the stunner, I wouldn't let him in the break. Uh, and I think he can gap Nibali, but not tomorrow. Tomorrow is why Cavendish and Damar are still here. Well, Damar's got Chiclamino, 152Ks, Borgo Valsugana to Treviso. There is a 1.1K, 11% wall, 50Ks from the finish. I do wonder whether, I don't know, Court was in the GC group today. Court's alive. He was in the GC group with, on like the last guy. I was like, what the fuck are you doing? Where have you been? So maybe he gets in the break. I don't know. Um, hopefully they try something. But FTJ and particularly Quickstep, Quickstep must be very motivated to try something for Cavendish. But if you're Demar, are you willing to just give away the stage to secure Chiclamino or would you still hunt for the stage regardless? I'd be a bit bit less motivated. Like, what, well, they've got three stage wins, Chiclamino wrapped up. Would you really bother too much? Probably. I mean, if you can win, he's the bit quickest sprinter, best sprinter here. Mm. You, you you know, you can go through a drought, make hay while the sun is shining. If, if you regret missing this chance, if you have another bad patch next year, I don't know. But, yeah, look to, like, Cavendish has just had two pretty miserable days in the mountains. Quickstep should be really on the front foot trying to get a result for him tomorrow as well as if Gaviria is still here. Otherwise, news from the Giro, Simon Yates abandoned. Obviously not on top shape yesterday. So he, yeah, he's gone two stage wins, which is 200 points. And then he will, not sure what his schedule is. He will recalibrate. He's obviously very important as Bike Exchange, uh, their best rider. It says he's doing the tour. Yep. What do you think? It has to be GC, right? On paper, it has to be GC, but I don't have a lot of confidence in it. I've like I've always found him a, a, such an inconsistent rider across years that it's so difficult to have confidence in his GC battles. But worst case scenario, if it doesn't work out for GC, he can once again get some stages. And yeah, it uh, is something that we'll see on the moment itself. I can't tell you how well he's going to do, but the parkour, it doesn't shout so many eights to me. Yeah, I know. High mountains. Whew like some nasty stages in the Alps. Yeah, I'm not sure. And the cobble stages and Denmark stages at the start, very stressful. Not sure that's his cup of tea either, uh, but we'll see what his goals are. I'm sure we'll see. I'm sure he'll try to stay close in week one and see how it goes. But that's all from the Giro d'Italia. Uh, I should give a pick for tomorrow. I'm going with Demar again for Benji. Okay, I'm going to go for... Uh, who is left in this race? Cavendish, Bauhaus, Gaviria. Uh, Dainese is still is he still here or is he gone? I actually don't know. I'm gonna go for Dainese, and if he's not here, then I'm also going for Damar. Dainese is here. He finished today in the group header. Okay, Dainese is gonna do it again. Okay, Gaviria, I think has been unlucky. He's still here with Richese. I wouldn't mind seeing Gaviria win. I think he deserves it. He's been trying really hard. But that's all from us today. If you want to check out the Tour of Norway highlights, I have it on the Lantern Rouge YouTube channel for all the stages at about uh, 8 to 9 p.m. UK European time. Do my best to get them up after the pod. Hope you enjoyed it. Let Benji know what you think about his new um, furry suit, the the shark. I'm going to get myself a narwhal of the Netherlands suit. Where's he actually from? Where's Lame Riser? What village is he from? I, I don't need know. To look it up his birthplace. Um, Absolutely no clue. <laughs> I should say, by the way, so you just reminded me because he's Dutch. MVP, crazy climb performance today. Um, but we'll see. Maybe him and Wout in the mountains in the Tour de France. That's a nice appetizer. This is the longest outro ever. We'll see you with a recap of stage 18 tomorrow. Ciao.